Well, welcome. And um, thank you for tuning in. It's wonderful to see all these faces and uh, to see, have this connection that, you know, has been going on now for almost two years through these talks. So we're so, so grateful that you show up um, and that we can, you allow us to bore you to sleep at night or, or to start your day in a boring way. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably relaxing just to like. Yeah, or irritating. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, anyway, <laughs> so this talk on the Mahavrata, the, the great vow, um, is one that we started sort of thinking of a while back. We were in communication with some friends who are some of our Buddhist friends and fellow practitioners who were talking about the Bodhisattva vow and taking some vows with um, other, in, you know, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And I started thinking about, you know, how is it in the yoga tradition that, you know, we feel so deeply connected to the Buddhist tradition and other traditions that are strong traditions in this world. Um, and yet in the yoga tradition, there isn't, as there is within the Buddhist tradition or within other traditions also, this sort of blatant vow that you take in public to say, this is what I believe in, in spite of the fact that, you know, there are many things that as yogis, we look about, look at and think about, yes, I believe in this and these are my ethical standards, etc. But there isn't that sort of ritual that is uh, as, as overtly a, um, a part of the yoga tradition, which is fascinating to me. And of course, when I first was thinking about that, I was thinking, oh, you know, it was, some of you may have read, I wrote an article in our newsletter a number of times ago when I was, one is coming soon, but when I was writing them very regularly, and it was about when we first started our yoga studio and we had a student and a teacher who was a wonderful friend and teacher, and she was saying, you know, but the, the problem is, you know, you, you haven't started this community here and you don't have your community set up. And it was back in the 90s when community was like this big word that people were just <laughs> beginning to sort of pay attention to. And I went into this sort of self-study thing, thinking, what on earth? How did I get this studio rolling? <clears throat> Excuse me. And forget to start a community, you know? And then I started thinking about it and realized, in fact, um, communities are things that, you know, happen sort of organically. And um, that let me relax about two years later when I, when I kind of had that realization that it wasn't my fault. Be, and that we had a very vibrant yeah. community, just like, you know, the, those of you who are here with us now, this is this sort of live community of people who have common interests. And you don't have to join formally. Yeah. At least not yet. Not you? yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And... And so then as I started thinking about taking a vow <clears throat> from the yogic perspective, that same idea sort of popped up in my mind. Like I have felt, and I know Richard has, and I've met many of you who feel very much like there is a kind of vow that you have taken or a promise or a an idea of this is something of deep meaning to you. Um, and so what we <clears throat> decided we'd do is to look at how it really is approached, how the idea of a vow is approached in the yoga tradition. Um, and, and then look at it also in context of other places in our lives that we take vows. For instance, the marriage vow, um, or you know, politicians take vows. Um, mm -hmm. Doctors, uh, oh. medical professionals take vows. 
And the idea of taking these vows or making a promise, a public promise of your what your intention is, um, is a really critical part of many religions and of many, many cultures and is this sort of thing that when you really take a vow that has meaning to you, it's something that kind of pulls on your heartstrings and it, it makes you feel um, that it, it has some groundedness that goes beyond your own um, being. Um, and so many of you know our friend Jules Levinson, who uh, works with us in our teacher's intensives. And we were uh, having dinner with him last night and talking about some of these ideas with, with him. And I brought up this idea that, well, gosh, you know, in the, the, this contrast between the Buddhist uh, tradition and the yogic tradition is really both curious and a little bit unsettling, but also fascinating because in the yoga tradition, it is as though we have, it's, it's a given that yes, if you're doing this, you are going to take some deep vows and maybe it's not as publicly, but it is something that you sort of assimilate. Mm -hmm. And Jules said this wonderful thing, which we both were like, oh, this is what we love about you, Jules. And for those of you who don't know Jules, he's, he's a, an amazing translator and Buddhist scholar. And he, you know, he thought about it and he said, you know, he adores India and he loves Indian culture. And he said, well, that makes absolute sense in terms of this tradition that is so alive <clears throat> in India. So diverse all over India, the yoga, yeah. different yoga, yoga schools. That yeah. It's and that India itself, if any of you have been there, is like that, that it's just sort of this place where, th there, where depth and meaning are s such a part of the um, fabric of the culture that that it's just part of what everyone does. And so he was saying, yeah, of course, it makes absolute sense in the yoga traditions that it would reflect this, this uh, part of the Indian culture, which was very fascinating and a, a nice idea to think about. But indeed, it is really talked about as the idea that taking a vow is of great importance, and it's in the Yoga Sutra, and it's a sutra that often is sort of skimmed over and not paid attention to. <laughs> so we thought we'd go into that a little bit and then talk about maybe how we might apply some of it to everyday life here. Yeah. And so, John, um, in the second chapter of Yoga Sutra, which they call um, Sadhanapada, which means doing something, <laughs> you know, what's the actual practice, rather than so you don't uh, get overwhelmed by just theory. Um, that's where they define, or Patanjali defines Ashtanga Yoga, and which is often referred to uh, as Raja Yoga, or the, the, the most royal or most, the very topmost of yoga. And this he does this around, I think, around verse 29. If you have a yoga, you know, I might get a number off here and there. Um, but that's where he defines, you know, Ashtanga Yoga as a Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Prachahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. Um, and so Yamas are the basic, um, what would we say? Um, things that you're going to do. Ethical, yeah. Yeah. And uh, then niyamas are just the, uh, the details, of the, pract the more practical uh, things that you really have to work with. They're the tools to make you get the, the yamas correct. And then, th if you actually do that well, you are much more connected to nature, to your body, to like the wonder of existence. And then asana 
is uh, kind of important because most of us, we identify with our bodies. And with asana, they're referring not only just to the uh, physical body, they say, oh, this is me, this, um, but also the uh, more subtle bodies, the mind, uh, all of the different layers of that. And uh, if you get grounded in asana, then you're ready for pranayama. Uh, and pranayama is probably the most profound and uh, challenging of all the different yoga. And there are all different kinds of pranayamas. And once you get pranayama and you, you start to feel the vibration, uh, which we call spanda shakti, or that's prana shakti. You just like you're. This is great. I love it. <laughs> and uh, you can't even say why, and you can't really define what it is. But then you go into prachahara, uh, which is complete uh, ability to feel sensation without the mind taking you anywhere. And so it's a uh, <coughs> fantastic thing where you become embodied with pure sensation, which is pure joy, which is, will be revealed in the Yoga Sutra later on. Um, and then also that the ability of the mind then is revealed because the mind doesn't wander off and you get to actually see or, you know, experience mind in all of its depths and mysteries. And, and then, oh, then finally you get to start the yoga, which is... Uh, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. And that's the ability to concentrate your mind very, very deeply on any kind of uh, space or pattern that uh, is of interest. And it could be a holy thing. For a lot of people, it's, you know, the things that you know, are holy to you. It could be, you know, some music or some uh, cultural thing that tur once turned you on. Or it could be a very modern thing. Or it could be uh, something happening uh, in the world of astronomy or astrophysics or <laughs> or you know whatever as long as it's like wow then you can focus the mind and in focusing the mind deeply you start to go you see its background you see th you see its context and this then takes you to moments of samadhi uh, and in samadhi, one lets go. It's One is literally awestruck and as if you were experiencing, uh, seeing as if something had was empty of self form. And uh, then you have this these three things at the end. That's your tool. Then you're a beginner in yoga. And finally, I'm a beginner and I take samyama, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, I travel around with it. I can even take it on airplanes, uh, through security at airports. If it wears a mask. Yeah, if it's mask, <laughs> right, yeah, you know, don't tell them about it. Um, but uh, and you take this tool, and finally, as a you you've qualified as a raw beginner, which is an extremely high um, state in yoga. So rather than oh, I've achieved yoga, now I finally can begin, and I have just uh, perhaps endless, or what we find out, perhaps endless lifetimes uh, to play with this stuff. And, uh, and so just in the, right after that verse, they start to, the Yoga Sutra defines the yamas. And the yamas are, this is the basics. And they are, are they, ahimsa, uh, which means not harming. Uh, Nonviolence is how it's always, but it's also sometimes translated as uh, kindness or compassion, ahimsa, not hurting anybody, even yourself. Oh, which eliminates a lot of our, some of our yoga practices. You can't hurt <laughs> yourself. Uh, then satya means to be honest or truthful. So satya is the truth. And it's not a truth that is necessarily philosophically defined but it's just seeing or experiencing uh, honesty or truth. Um, and it, it has to do with waking up yeah. to seeing what is actually arising in that 
moment um, and yeah. the truth of connecting to that. Yeah. And then um, asteya, which is, again, means not stealing. And this means not stealing uh, anything that isn't yours. And so, and you can go into that, well, what is mine? <laughs> and uh, turns out there's not much that's yours in a metaphysical sense. But even on a practical level, you know, you don't want to take uh, uh, steal from some other person uh, their their food or their and in the the age of the internet, you don't want to steal their their work. You know, even if you can't remember where you stole the quotation from, uh, <laughs> you don't want to. And, and so this is a habit of not of again of being very nice to other people, and we see how. The ego uh, tends to really, you know, out of jealousy or out of something, I want that, so I'm going to take it. And then the next one is called brahmacharya, which is usually translated as, uh, how do they translate? Celibacy? Yeah. And uh, this is not, and if someone is a, uh, um, has taken, is a, a monk or a nun, uh, and has taken those vows, it, it's more obvious, but it also means celibacy on the level of not just not indulging, but not doing it even in your imagination, uh, taking another person as an object to just gratify you. Uh, and so there's, and we'll go into that a little bit more, but there's the yogic view of brahmacharya, uh, which is uh, a way of finding internally, and this is the way it's actually can be interpreted in the Yoga Sutra, that in terms of tantric yoga, raja yoga, hatha yoga, which is central channel in kundalini, uh, you're the brahmacharya is actually the meditation on three different bindus, which means a droplet. Uh, one is the mind, uh, and so you're you're uh, along the central channel. There are methods where you uh, go ah, and you're able to watch your mind because uh, you either it's a particular day of the week and you have a feeling for that one, or it's just your natural tendency. Oh, I can watch mind. Another is prana, and prana is direct sensation, uh, and some people are more easily they can just watch prana and through the prana discover that prana and the mind um, totally uh, generate each other. They're in, inescapably intertwined, but they're not actually the same thing as you initially experienced. Mm -hmm. And then the third uh, bindu or the third droplet is called virya, uh, which means often is translated as courage or the ability to uh, do something, you know, you get that. And so the, all of these are located along the central channel and um, you, with that you can become true brahmacharya in which you treat other beings as brahman. Yeah. Uh, and so this is something that even uh, in terms of we were talking about Indian culture, they're still in the throngs of evolution in terms of how uh, people treat each other uh, intimately. Yeah. And then the final one is the called aparigraha. And that means don't... I like to do that with my hand, I don't know why. <laughs> that means don't take anything, don't like a pick at anything in all dimensions, all around in all directions. In other words, let go, because the joy of yoga is in letting go. Um, and in doing that, you're no longer like grasping at even the, uh, you say, oh, I want the status of being a pure yogi, or I want to be like the god Indra, or I want to be like you know, the a bodhisattva, I want to be a Buddha, I want to be uh, president. 
or I want to be the dictator. Um, there are all kinds of different desires that we get. And um, to not have, to let them go, even if they are there in aparigraha, even if you're, you, you start to see your own ego function and your own ignorance, and you can let it go, and you experience it as spanda shakti or as chit shakti, uh, as like, oh, it's this, it's this clear light, even if it's something that is like amazing, like the, like the universe or your own shadow side, which is, un- and this is where yoga gets interesting because when we start practicing, occasionally, uh, as you're having a wonderful practice, you'll notice your mind, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of wanders off on something that might be irritating. Uh, and it could be, you know, your own mind wandering off, or it could be someone else's mind wandering off that is irritating, or something that is you're really lusting after, like uh, fame and fortune and... Pizza. Yeah, or pizza. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, so the, uh, and so these five things, uh, starting with ahimsa, which is the, the most important one, that is not hurting others, uh, they are called the Mahavrata. And for that's, I think, verse 30, mm-hmm. which is the great vow, uh, which then, uh, and then the Yoga Sutra goes on to explain the Niyamas, but then it goes right back after it explains the Niyamas, uh, which are also very wonderful, it starts to go into what to do if your mind uh, is angry or mean or, uh, or if you, you, you're sitting and you're practicing and you notice like, oh, and what you actually have to do, because your mind's already wandered off, is you have to practice pratipaksha kriya. And pratipaksha, so paksha means a wing, uh, like oh, I see in this... <laughs> Or what are, you can see one of Garuda's wings. Okay, so and so there's a paksha, and then the other wing is the pratipaksha. <laughs> and so you deliberately um, meditate on the opposite wing. So if I find myself wanting to, uh, you know, if I'm angry with some other person, I notice the anger, but I also watch the opposite of the the fact, like if I, you know, engage in this activity, which would be harmful, what's the effect of that? And so, and in this way, you start to see yourself and others uh, really as very similar structures. And uh, you're able to uh, literally, pranically, bring them into your heart, which is uh, where you, which is oh, really even though you know it's the, it could be the you know the the most irritating people or the most wonderful people that you envy or or you're mad at yourself because here I am you know I go to all of this to go to yoga and do a little bit of pranayama and all of a sudden um, I start to see that oh my god you know I this is these. Um, demonic tendencies actually are within my own uh, prana body and my own uh, karmic body. And, And, you know, so part of the way it's laid out, it seems, in the Yoga Sutra um, is this, has a really interesting parallel to the Bodhisattva vow, which is this vow that you know, you vow to uh, work towards becoming uh, clear and, you know, potentially enlightened. And you vow also to not just, you know, disappear and go up to heaven if that it does happen to you, but to stay and to help others. Yeah. And so the vow really becomes this, this aspect of uh, wanting to prevent, you know, to do what you can to help suffering diminish in the world. 
Um, and it, it has this extreme element of a, a dedication and a, a real joy in service to other beings. And when you look at the Mahavrata in the Yoga Sutra in this way, especially when you pay attention to this idea of the bindus, where you are, a, a practice that you can do is to really focus the mind, on the mind, focus on the embodied sense of prana. And, and you know, that, that you then spontaneously, in a sense, start to feel the um, real relevance of the other um, yamas, like um, not harming and like taking care of being the, honest. and being honest and not stealing. Yeah. And so in a sense, these are you, the meditation on those things are like the preliminary practices that you must do <clears throat> in order for the unfolding of this sort of insight into the desire to help others to spontaneously arise. Um, and in, you know, in the Buddhist tradition where um, the, there are, you know, there are more specific sort of rituals that you do to take vows um, and the bodhisattva vow, there are these preliminary practices that you do, for instance, you know, really looking at um, this sense of interconnectedness, etc. And there, you know, if you, if you go to the way of the Bodhisattva, that wonderful text that has many incredible uh, okay. translations. Bodhicharya Avatara yeah. of Shantideva. Yeah. It, it, it really gives you this sense of the importance of taking, taking what we do um, and how we behave in this world and how we take care of one another and how we're honest, um, taking it really to the next level of seriousness. And, and in modern yoga, and unfortunately in modern politics, and also in you know, Buddhist practices and many other religious practices, sometimes what happens is that, that we get inspired. We, we go to these practices. We get really inspired by a religion or by yoga. Um, because we happen to intersect them at a time in our lives where, where we're feeling open, where we're also feeling that, uh, you know, we want to do something, like you were saying, take action. And um, then we start seeing the results of what we do, and, and that same thing we often talk about uh, that happens where the mind comes in and um, immediately takes over and twists it and the vow or the intention that we have to do something good gets taken over by the ego function. And this happens even for those who, who have taken bodhisattva vows um, or yoga vows or vows of marriage or vows to be politicians. Um, it, it happens that the ego can easily take over. And so then what is really taught in these traditions is that it's not like a one-time thing where you take this vow and that you then, um, okay, great, I did that, now I can just go on about my day. But that pretty much many people who practice yoga or practice um, Buddhist practices you take these vows and you look at them seriously at least once a day. You know, you really <laughs> s say them to yourself so, because you realize that it is the nature of being a human that you're gonna slip up. And rather than, than giving up or going into some um, realm that is less uh, generous, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we end up having a sense of forgiveness and saying, what can I do to, uh, to 
shift the tides a little bit. Because if you've taken, say, a vow to be kind, and then it just takes one time of having, of yelling at someone or thinking a terrible thought about someone to really just up, you know, uproot the whole thing. And so if you're, if you're thinking, well, it has to be perfect, um, you run into some problems. But if you don't correct yourself, you want to run into worse problems. So you need these, you need to take uh, set intentions in life and, and um, yeah. and I think take it's, these vows. Yeah, and it's a vow like this, um, whatever language you use, um, but the, it's a vow like that, that it really exposes in the language of the Yoga Sutra, uh, the five kleshas, mm -hmm. um, which are, uh, and these are the five, uh, klesha means sufferings or afflictions. And the first one of those is ignorance, uh, meaning you don't understand what's going on <laughs> in, inside, outside, anywhere. And then from that ignorance comes uh, egotism, which is the um, nature of all minds, has this function of ego. Uh, even a bodhisattva mind, uh, it moves because of asmita, or ego. And then from ego, which is a natural, don't worry, it's not you, it's, you're not your ego, don't worry about that, um, <laughs> they say. Uh, it comes raga, meaning the, the, the imagination of the mind creates uh, all kinds of things that you want. Uh, like even getting out of here, you know, I want liberation from the planet Earth, and uh, I want to go to, what's the, is it Mars? <laughs> <laughs> or the moon, I'm not sure which is coming up. Um, and so you, you start craving that, or I crave uh, to be like uh, part of this special yoga group and uh, I, the, the glory and praise when uh, you know we take over the earth, uh, or all kinds of things. And then, so that's raga, and then instantly part of raga uh, that forms almost as a shadow uh, is dvesha, which is hatred or repulsion, You're like, yeah. And uh, this can be either towards, you know, one of your own mental states or towards other beings. And those, you, those, those are actually inseparable. And then abhinavesha is the final one, which is an, what I would say of a physical, organic uh, reaction in the, you know, that built into the body. Uh, which is to uh, not want to die, <laughs> at least not right now. You can say, oh, in the future I look forward to my wonderful death, you know, and I have thousands of people singing my name <laughs> in different churches around the universe, and oh, <laughs> I just exposed that. But, um, but Abhinavesha is still, the, it's an organic part of being uh, an organism, uh, which is most profound in, in that it, it reacts to that movement, uh, which is like the uh, central channel mm -hmm. opening. And, uh, and in fact, one can't really go deep into uh, the tantric or the esoteric hatha yoga until abhinavesha, or that natural fear of death, uh, is addressed. And, and of course, we always translate it as fear of yoga or fear of life. Fear of, li fear of life and fear of death turn out to be... It's kind of the same thing. Kind of the same thing. <laughs> or fe fear of the dissolution of ego, yeah. which is another uh, way of looking at it. And, and with, the, with the raga and the dvesha, or the grasping and the pushing away, that is so relevant to taking a vow, where you... You know, you take a vow and then you've made it so literal that, um, mm -hmm. that you want, that, you know, there is this grasping onto what you have associated with that outcome of the vow to be. And so with so many things in life and in yoga and in this case, you know, taking the, a mahavrata or even a little rather than a big vow, 
a little vow. Um, it is a way of, in a way, focusing the attention so that you can then wake up to what's actually happened in the moment and not be thrown off by the inevitable fact that things will not turn out exactly the way you're imagining them to turn out, even if you've taken a great vow. You know, so that the, this instant of, yes, I've been saying my prayers, my mantras, my, you know, doing my visualizations, etc., and then I, you know, someone cuts me off in traffic and I yell at them in my own car as an introvert rather than honking, um, that, 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 that you've, you know, you've broken, in a sense, you've broken the vow. And um, so then you become the, like the devesha or the anger or the pushing away of that behavior starts to sort of undermine your vow as well. So that's why it's really important to know these roots of suffering, to, to see through them, to see uh, beyond them, and to know that they are really just part of the human condition. And that mm -hmm. once you start seeing, oh, there I am again, grasping, ah, oh, there I am again, fearing mm -hmm. death of my ego, you know, or my own death, then you start to have, within the embodied experience, you start to have freedom of breath, freedom of the nervous system, freedom of sort of internal movements of energy, if you want to call them that, so that you can really get down to the work of whatever it is you have set as your, uh, in this case, what we're talking about are vows, is to set as your aim in life for what you might do um, and how you might bring some of these elements of goodness to fruition. I was reading a little bit today, mm -hmm. thinking about this talk about Bernie Glassman Roshi, who's a, who is my teacher, uh, Joan Halifax, Roshi Joan Halifax's teacher, uh, was Bernie Glassman, and he worked with homeless people in New York, I think, in Yonkers. And so his vow was to help relieve suffering in that part of New York and came to the conclusion relatively soon in his work that you, you know, he was not going to be able to end homelessness. But that didn't stop him mm -hmm. from doing his work that by being able to make a little difference or a slight difference that then has this impact of you know, what he did, then impacting others, and then that impacting others, that is enough to keep the integrity of one's aim in life going, rather than the perfection of, oh, well, I can't even do anything because what am I going to do? Homelessness is going to... It's too big it's a problem too big a for problem me to, to have do any anything. influence. Yeah. yeah. And, uh... and of course, it's natural to feel that, and to feel that overwhelm, especially in today's world. But at the same time, if you don't uh, take the actions, if you don't take yourself, your, um, you know, your impact on others seriously enough to take responsibility for your actions and to do whatever you can to live up to the standards that you feel are important or that your tradition has suggested uh, are important, then, you know, you're just out there in this big ocean with no rudder. And uh, yeah, it's and not going to do much good for other people. Yeah, and there's this, and that's one of the, the things that happens in religious practices and, and yoga practices, is people that say, oh, it's too big. I'm just out of here. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a fairly common reaction that they call in the uh, tradition tamasic, mm -hmm. or it's dull. And we all, we all have uh, phases where the mind becomes like, Duh. and uh, <laughs> this is, 
forget it, you know. And uh, then, but the thing with the, you know, at least having the, the echo of the, the Bodhisattva vow that you took 10 seconds ago, uh, before your mind wandered off, um, you, you notice that. And uh, then you start to see, oh, and then you I say, well, maybe, you know, maybe just a little bit, I can at least make, you know, this being next to me, you know, or, and, and so they say, it's like, so what part of the, the niyamas, which are the next mm-hmm. group, you know, which are kind of the practical steps to the great vow or the yamas, uh, is saucha or being, and often translated as cleanliness. But it's uh, and often misinterpreted as we got to be clean because the body is disgusting or something. But no, that it's uh, a way of appreciating uh, the little things around you that are natural. Mm-hmm. It's so it's just like when you go outside and there's nature and you go, oh, that's beautiful, or you're with some smaller creature. You know, it doesn't have to be human, um, yeah. or even with the humans. You know. Uh, and if you know you just that little connection make you feel ah, oh, and then they might and and then that's the whole idea of you just your immediate body internal external and the environment of the body and the other beings that are involved with the body uh, some of which you um, have to have for dinner. <laughs> um, even vegetarians are eating uh, plants, you know. And, uh, but the, the the quality of that interface uh, has a very profound effect. And then from that, you get information like, oh, this, then you start to see, oh, this spreads to past my particular neighborhood or past my, my room and spreads over, you know, all around the world. And, you, and just that you've, Intuition then of interconnectedness, of you know environmentally and then psychologically, mentally, with uh, maybe at least in the, you're inspired to yeah. do something. And it's really important with you know I, I, one element in terms of taking a vow is that it, it's different from just uh, sort of sort of thinking okay I'm going to aim at being, you know, helping there be more peace in the world and just internally thinking that. When you take a vow, often there is this element of some sort of public um, to sort of interchange with it, even if it's with um, just one other person, um, even if it is, um, you know, in a big group of taking some, some huge vow, that you that you rely on the fact that you are <clears throat> doing, using, you know, teachings, that you're using the connection to other people or sangha, um, and um, the, um, you know, the main teacher that you might have, at, or the, in Buddhist terms, it would be the, the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the sangha, of those mm-hmm. elements supporting you and allowing you to uh, see that this is a step-by-step interconnected process that is that comes to life when we connect with others, any kind of vow that we take. Mm-hmm. Um, when His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, teaches, you know, talks about the Bodhisattva vow, he will um, one of the things that I think he and many others do is that in preparation for taking this vow, that is this step-by-step process of being there of service to others after you yourself have you know, taken steps to become enlightened. But before you even do that, you visualize you know, all of the great teachers, all of your teachers, your family, your circumstances, the, the people who have been uh, strong in your life as well as the lineages behind all of these things 
that as if they are all there in communion with you as this kind of support so that it, there is this intuitive sense that starts, mm. that is part of the yoga tradition, this intuitiveness, um, that, yeah, this is not just about you when you take a vow. It is about um, what can you do to um, be part of this bigger whole, which is um, an important aspect of any of this that we you know, take on when we take on the yamas or we take on a particular vow of any sort. How can this really reflect this non-me-ness, this part of me that is just absorbed into the vastness of all of the rest of the world? Um, and that's what gives it the juice, and that's what gives it keeps the motivation strong rather than ego-driven. It keeps it cl more clear. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. So a nice thing about the Yoga Sutra and the Ashtanga of the Patanjali, of the Raja Yoga, is the emphasis is very distinct and clear on um, the connection to Hatha Yoga, uh, Tantra, and Kundalini, mm -hmm. and uh, which is also there, uh, but the emphasis is like, oh, let's try, let's get really practical with a good asana and uh, then pranayama, and then it's like, ah, oh, I feel it. Yeah. and. Uh, it, so it takes it a little bit off of the, uh, the theoretical. Yeah, and so uh, the, a wonderful part. If that's an obstacle. Yeah, yeah of the yoga tr uh, tradition and the yoga approach to taking vows is that, that it really has all of this connection with others as part of it, but it, it has this uh, incredible uh, sense of you have a responsibility as an individual that is part of something bigger than just you as an individual, you have a real responsibility to take whatever actions need to be taken, to do whatever practices need to be taken so that you embody these mm -hmm. things yeah. rather than just theorize about them. And theorizing about them is an important thing. Yeah, since you're going to theorize can, a yeah. lot. <laughs> But again, it was interesting in this conversation we had with Jules that he was talking about some of the Tibetan, older, older Tibetan people and their sense of just being connected to earth, being so deeply embodied and grounded. Yeah, very grounded. And just, I think it has something to do with uh, the environment that uh, traditionally mm -hmm. <laughs> they're in, which is a, a, a rather um, challenging environment to live. You know, we, we think Colorado is challenging <laughs> and Tibet is three times yeah. more up there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and just that practicality has allowed them to be kind of almost naturally or culturally extremely embodied. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, yeah. So when we when we we wanted to just sort of leave this with you, leave some time for some questions, but also this idea of taking the time within your own practice, within your own day, if you don't do that much practice, but within your own day, um, to really look at what it is um, that you consider to be sort of the promises you've made. When you look up vow in the dictionary, it kind of talks about promises. Um, but it's also like, what, what uh, intentions do you have? And that, that having s some sense of clarity about what your intentions are in any given situation, but also an underlying I think that the idea of the Mahavrata um, or the 
any kind of vow is that gives you an it gives you a foundation mm -hmm. from which then you are faced with life and you say oh well um, my overall intention is mm -hmm. I'd like to help relieve mm -hmm. suffering yeah I forgot to mention that they call it the Mahabharata um, because it's not uh, you don't adjust it according to right circumstances like they, they, they say jata which is often translated as your birth um, so even if you're you know of which would also include species you know if you want to really go into it you know because we all have different circumstances tendencies talents uh, cultural situations and I'm going to keep this vow no matter what the birth and uh, also time, mm -hmm. meaning historical time. Um, you know, it could be the Kali Yuga, or it could be a great time, or it could be a terrible time, or it could be death, or it could be after death. You know, in the, you're in the, the bardos, as the Tibetans like to say. You know, it's still, that's my promise. Um, and, it, and it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, this person or that person. It's... It's for everyone. Yeah, it's for everyone. Yeah. For all the time. And and that's yeah. those that's, three things. That's what makes it Maha. And, yeah. Oh. Those elements, you know, especially the one of it's for these people but not these people, that's one of the ones that we get tripped up in by mm. as humans sometimes when we mm -hmm. take a vow and we say, oh, aren't I special? I have this vow that I've taken, and then you catch yourself and you laugh. And so a great part of any vow is to be able to maintain your sense of humor um, and see, wow, I am acting like a human being. And <laughs> let me, <laughs> it's embarrassing, and let me have some self-reflection and, um, and then look beneath all of this and come back to what I really see as having meaning um, for me. Um, I'm very, very much in love with the, the vows that at, um, at Upaya Zen Center are the ones that are always sort of the, the vows that are sung there. And it mm -hmm. is, a, I thought it could be nice to just read those we at the end because they really are at the zen center it is very much a reflection of you know this sense of integrity as um part of something bigger than oneself um and the ability to to reflect on um the fact that you know you it the importance of taking a vow, the importance of having an, an, a solid connection with what your intention in life is, and then the ability to start over with every breath with it. Um, and it is, you know, what they chant, and I, I love it, is um, that creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to transform them. Reality is boundless, and I try, try, vow, and I vow to perceive it. And the awakened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. So the mm. awakened way. How mm. do we embody that? Mm. And and. It isn't only theory. And that's where the yoga practices are so amazing, is that they really turn it over to the process of embodiment, everything. And the awakened way, we all know that feeling. Remember, I kind of said in the beginning that taking a vow is something that you really feel it almost pull on your heartstrings. It, it makes you feel like this is important mm -hmm. and it's who you are. And uh, that is embodying it. And if you start to 
disconnect from that feeling of sort of visceral feeling of truth, then it's time to look at your intentions, look at your vows and say, what am I, mm. what am I missing here? And then come back to it, look at it and, and make new effort. So. Shall we? Uh... Yeah. So we've blabbed for a while, and we hope that it has, you know, given you a little something to think about. Um, we'll stop the recording, but we want to. We wanted to end it with, well, with the um, closing. Chain. Yeah, what is really important in yoga is to not hold on to this and say, "Okay, I've got it," but to really offer it, <laughs> offer whatever good. Um, might have come from this that offer it that it may serve others and we do okay. the closing chant the closing chant which okay Om Swasti Prajabhya Paripalayantam Nayena Margena Mahim Mahesha Go Brahmane Bia Shubhamastu Nityam Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu Om Shanti 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 Thank you. Thanks. Okay.